right, I want to welcome everybody that will be viewing by way of YouTube. We're so glad to have you. We hope if you're ever in the area here that you'll come by and visit with us. We would love to meet and greet you and to uh, welcome you here to Ranchero Drive Baptist Church. And so I want you to turn in your Bibles tonight if you have them. I trust that you do. Proverbs chapter 16, I want to finish the message that I started about ruling your own spirit. Ruling your own spirit. And uh, boy, you know, we live in a time, have you all ever seen any road rage? Maybe, maybe you've been the one that's been enraged. I won't, I won't ask you to raise your hand, all right? But uh, how many of you all talk to other drivers when you're driving? All right, I see who you are. I see who we are. Yeah, okay. And, uh, and so you may not say it out loud. How many of you all talk to them silently? <laughs> there you go. I knew I'd get the rest of you, all right? And, uh, and so, you know, and it's good. You don't say everything that you think or feel, brother. That's good. And, uh, you know, and some people are not that self-possessed. Some people just can't keep their mouth shut. Some people feel compelled, they have to tell you, even though you didn't ask them what they thought. But they feel like they have to tell you. And so part of that is the lack of ruling your own spirit. Those things are all based upon pride. Look at this passage with me, the book of Proverbs. If you split your Bible in half, you should come to the book of Psalms. If you turn right from the book of Psalms, you'll come to the book of Proverbs. And look with me, please. Proverbs chapter 16 and look in verse 32. Notice what this says. Proverbs 16, 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And, and, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Now just imagine what that means. Uh, uh, the person who could take a city, he's got the army, he's got the strength, he's got the physical power to conquer a city, all the, all the, uh, all the authorities that are in there, all that are designed to present a defense. He could overcome them physically but yet he cannot control his own spirit. And what this passage says, the man or the woman who can rule their own spirit is even stronger than a person who could conquer a city just by themselves. So what does that tell you about how, how dominant, how great our pride is? The fact that we have to say what we think or feel. Look in, look in Proverbs uh, 25 with me. And look at the last verse in Proverbs 25. Notice what this says. That's verse 28, Proverbs 25. Notice what this says. He that hath no rule, no governance... You see, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. What does that mean? A city that has no walls of protection, it's subject to everything to come in, to aggravate it, to agitate it, to infect it, to do whatever. And so that's what it's like because, you know, it's almost, and I don't want to say that we're dogs, although Jesus did tell that woman she was a Gentile dog. But you know the reason why a lot of times dogs act up when they're out in public? It's there's so much stimuli. They see another dog, they see a cat, they, uh, they see another person, they see a toy, they see a ball, they see a kid on a bicycle, they hear a motorcycle. All these stimulations come in all at one time and man, they're excited to be out there. And what do they do? And you're like this, whoa, you're holding on to the chair. Why? Because they lack self-control. That's why you got a collar and a leash on them, right? That can be trained. They have to learn not to react to every stimuli that is out there. That's what this verse is teaching. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is subject to every stimulation that's out there. And so what happens sometimes? You all know what a knee-jerk reaction is? Do you know what that means, Sister Jew, a knee-jerk reaction? What that means is you have this little, you have this uh, like a little tendon here in your knee and the doctor sometimes wants to see how that's working. 
And so he's got a little rubber mallet, and he comes along, and he hits your knee right there. Whoa, oh, you know, and he does that, and it makes your knee go, that's a knee jerk. So it was by the stimulation, it moves, all right? So sometimes people do things impulsively, the knee jerk reaction. They don't think it through. They don't deliberate. They just respond, and then they go, like, oh, gee, I'm sorry. You know, and some people say, well, man, I, I'm, I'm just like a volcano. I explode and I get over it. Yeah, but look how much damage a volcano does. Do you remember Mount St. Helens? Some of y'all may not have been born then. I was in Alaska when Mount St. Helens erupted. I used to have some of the ash from Mount St. Helens. I lost it in Hurricane Andrew, I believe. But uh, I used to have a little bufferin bottle. Remember bufferin? Little asthma used to be out there, and I, somebody went down there and got me some, brought it back, all that pumice. And, uh, and so, yeah, look what it did. I mean, instantaneously vaporized. I forget how many hundreds of acres, all in one moment, vaporized. <laughs> Rocks, everything, sis. Just in what they call a pyroclastic cloud. And somehow they were able to measure the speed of that. 600 miles per hour, it moved out. That's pretty fast for dirt to fly. <laughs> That's what it did. And, uh, and, so, and there are some people that are like volcanoes. Other people say, well, I don't do that. I just do a slow burn on the inside. And they smolder and they just all the time. And, you know, and one more thing gets them. That's it. Man, here it comes. Some on some poor unsuspecting soul. So, beloved, we've got to learn how to rule our own spirit. You know, the old saying is, you know, whatever you're full of, when somebody rubs you the wrong way, is what they're going to get. If you and I were full of castor oil, if we, had it, if we had it here in a glass, if we had castor oil, that's something people used to take here in America. It was nasty, but it would make you feel better eventually, all right? Oh, you use it. Okay, castor oil. And, uh, and so, so anyway, if you're full of castor oil and somebody bumps into you, what are they going to get? They're going to get castor oil on them, aren't they? It's whatever you're full of. If you're full of yourself and somebody bumps into you and you don't rule your own spirit, what are they going to get? They're going to get that old nasty self that's there. But we, wanna, we want the Spirit of God to be at work in our lives, to helping us. Someone wrote a book entitled, Your Reactions Are Showing. Our reactions to things. They need to be measured. Well, I picked out three men because there's certainly more than that that we can look at. In part one of this message, I, I, I started with this on David. There are three men. I picked out David. I picked out Nehemiah. And the last one is Paul that we're going to look at. And so we've already talked about David and we said some things that what he did to help himself, look, look in, right quick, look in Psalm 131. Turn back left in your Bible and look in Psalm 131. Notice what David says here, Psalm 131. Notice how he put this. He said, Lord, my heart is not haughty. That means to be full of pride, nor mine eye lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. So, you know, what you're going to find with James, little James, as cute as he is, when, when, uh, when the bottle is gone or whatever y'all are doing, little James is going to show out. Now, that's a southern term, show out, right? And he's going to misbehave, isn't he? All right? When you've weaned, how, ladies, how many of y'all have weaned children? You know, you know uh, yeah. How, how do they, yeah, I mean, man, they, you know, they pull at your clothes. They want the bottle. They want, I mean, they're unhappy. And they're going to let you know about it, aren't they? But David said, I've quieted myself as a weaned child. In other words, growing up, maturing, and realizing that I can't have everything just the way that I want it. That's part of growing up. 
Now, we don't like that because we want things to go the way that we want them to go. But that's not reality because we're not the hub, meaning life doesn't revolve around us, does it? It does not. Now, some of us think we're the hub, but you're not. <laughs> we thought we were men till the first child came along. We realized we were not the hub. Somehow the little wheel took over, didn't it? The little child, they became the hub. And, uh, and so, you know, hey, you know, I, re I remember, <laughs> I'll just tell this, I remember when, uh, when Christy got married and Doug had, come moved, or had, Doug had come down from Pennsylvania to gather up her things and he put them in a U-Haul and put her little car on, on one of those little dollies in the back and towed that, getting ready to tow it out and we're out there in the parking lot or the parsonage and and, uh, you know, and I'm telling Doug, bye, and Christy's hugging us, bye, babe, and we'll be praying for you on your trip, long trip from Texas to Pennsylvania up there by Valley Forge, and, and we're waving, we're waving, we're waving, we're waving. They got out of sight, hey, baby, let, let's go have breakfast. Man, the kids are gone. The last one had left. I felt like I was the hub again. You'll get that, some of you that haven't experienced that, you'll get that down the road. But there was that nice day, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And it was just you and the wife again. What a blessing. So David learned some things. And I said he humbled himself. And I looked at those things. He quieted himself. He comforted himself. He found, he found the promises that were in the Scriptures. You know, the Word of God can be a comfort to us if you'll allow it. If you'll receive the Word of God with meekness, it will bring comfort in your life. He also encouraged himself. He had time in prayer. Boy, when, when you get discouraged, that's the time to get before the Lord. That's why he said we're to come boldly to the throne of grace. That what? That we might obtain grace and find mercy to help in time of need. All right, that we might find mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's grace, that divine enabler. And so David did all those things. David did those things that he might learn to work through some of those things rather than overreacting to the stimulus that comes, to the negative things, to the circumstances. A lot of times, because you know what happens. Hey, there are disappointments. Sometimes there's distresses. Sometimes there's disagreements between people. Sometimes, you know, and there's a thousand other things sometimes that we may face on a daily basis. And every morning have to get up and, oh, that problem still hadn't gone away. Oh, I still got to face that again. What do you do? Man, you've got to take solace in some of these things. And there are things that we can learn from these men. So David did a number of things because, you know, David did have a lot of issues. David did have a lot of trials and troubles. Just read the Psalms and you'll find that out. Many of, many of these things, they're songs, but boy, they were prayers that were put to music because his issues were real, just like some of ours are. They're real. And so David humbled himself, he quieted himself, he comforted himself, he encouraged himself. Well, what about, what about, you know, and so not taking matters in his own hands, David had hope. That's why Paul will say, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. His might. And so, so let's look at Nehemiah. Let's, let's move forward. Turn left from the book of Psalms. Turn left in your Bible. And you'll come to the book of Job. You'll come to Nehemiah. Esther. All right, keep going to Nehemiah. And look with me in Nehemiah chapter 5. Ne Nehemiah chapter 5. And while you're turning there, let me just give you a little, a little history of the book of Nehemiah. When the children of Israel were deported out of the land under Nebuchadnezzar, they took a bunch of them and they took them over into Babylon and so forth. And so that's where they were in Babylon. That's where the book of Daniel comes from, the book of Jeremiah, the book of Ezekiel. Jeremiah was, was the prophet that stayed in Jerusalem, stayed in the area of Judea. Ezekiel was deported and went into Babylonia where Daniel went and the others and, uh, and so Nehemiah is a man then has come up in generations of being out of, the, out of the nation of Israel, out of the country. 
And he's come up under different leaders now. Nebuchadnezzar, we know, has gone off the scene. The Medes and Persians come along. And so there's Cyrus. And so then there's Artaxerxes and so forth. These Persian kings that, that Daniel and that, and that Nehemiah are going to have to deal with. Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer. And so Nehemiah learns about what it's like back in Jerusalem and his heart is broken over these things. And so God in His sovereignty and goodness arranges it where Nehemiah can come back to help rebuild the walls and gates of Jerusalem. Remember a city without walls? He knew what these things were. When you see on the news the, the western wall, the wailing wall, that's the wall of the old city that, that if you will, that was, was remains of what they rebuilt back in those days. But Titus of Rome in 70 A.D. overthrew all of that. After, after the Lord Jesus was crucified, 70 A.D. So we're looking at something in history. And so Nehemiah is trying to rebuild these walls. And you know, the devil just can't stand prosperity. And so he's got some guys that come along in his life. There's Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem. And so these people, man, they're against what Nehemiah is trying to do. And they don't want these walls rebuilt. Look in Nehemiah with me. Look in chapter 5. Look in verse 7. Well, let, let's, uh, let's go back and uh, let's look at verse, at verse 6. Nehemiah hears all this stuff, and uh, people, are, people are, are getting upset and so forth over what has happened. The wall is being built. Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian, they've all, they've all tried to defeat them, all tried to hinder them, to get under their skin. And so what, what, did they, what were they doing while they were building? In one hand they had a trowel. What did they have in the other hand? Do you remember? They had a sword or a spear, didn't they? So they were building and battling at the same time. Man, that's a lot to have to get done, isn't it? Building and battling. And so now they start complaining. Look at verse 5. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons, our daughters, to be servants, and some of our daughters are brought up into bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them, and other men have our lands. And I mean, they've gone to whining, the people there. They had a mind to build, and so they've been infected by the discouragement that was taking place. Look at verse 6. Look what Nehemiah says. And I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. Even the best of men sometimes can get angry. The problem is when we get angry about things that we have no right to be angry over. <laughs> In other words, sometimes we're just angry because things aren't going our way. That's not a legitimate reason to be angry. But what did Nehemiah do? Look in verse 7. You ought to underline this word. Then I consulted with myself. Now notice what he said. And I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, Ye exact usury and every one of his brother. And I set a great assembly against them. In other words, it didn't keep him from saying to them what needed to be said, but he just was going to do it in the right spirit. He was going to rule over his own spirit. And he did that by consulting with himself. In other words, to keep himself in check, and he kind of said, I don't know what he called himself, but he might have said, Son, you better hold on here. <laughs> you better slow down before you say something you're going to regret. You better handle this thing wisely. You know, what that simply means is he gave some serious thought, some contemplation before responding. It wasn't that knee-jerk, it wasn't that impulsive reaction, but he handled the matter, what? He handled it, first of all, patiently. And I know, man, that word gets next to us. The older we get, it seems like that's the thing we run out of. I don't know why that is. I, you know, I don't know if it's the pride of life Is that as a part of that. I just know sometimes, you know, sometimes as older people, sometimes we get a reputation of just being what? Cranky. Grumpy, 
Never, never, huh? What is that? You, you, you younger folks, you haven't got there yet, but you'll get there. <laughs> Some of you might have that reputation already. Oh, don't bother Dad right now. He might be grumpy. <laughs> I'm just saying that, that uh, but the need for patience. I, I see it now more in my life than I did even when I was younger. Patience. But Nehemiah did that. He consulted with himself. That means he took some time. And sometimes before you respond, beloved, you're going to have to set yourself down. If you have to get alone by yourself, get off to yourself, or maybe say, listen, I can't speak to that right now. You've got to give me a few minutes. It might be that you need a day. Hey, I'll talk with, I, I can't talk about that right now. Please understand me. I'll talk to you about that tomorrow. It doesn't always mean that you're angry. It might just mean that maybe you have something more pressing at the time. But I don't want to give an offhanded remark. I don't want to answer something prematurely because what does the Bible say? Doesn't the scripture say that the righteous studieth to answer? That means they're going to think it through. What are the consequences of my decision? Is this going to hurt someone? Is this going to help us as a family? What is this going to do? And a lot of times when, you know, when, if we just give it the knee jerk, then, boy, don't you hate to back up and then have to say, man, I'm sorry, I spoke out of turn. I shouldn't have answered you the way that I did. When you get tired of apologizing, you'll do more of this consulting because it's got to be made right. He handled it prudently. He didn't respond right away. Prudence, remember what prudence is? Prudence is how do I avoid trouble? How do I, how do I avoid evil? A prudent man foreseeth the evil. He needed to think logically, otherwise it's just going to be a, it was just going to be a battle of words between these groups. He needed to do that the right way, and he did it privately. Who did he consult with? Himself. He did it privately. He didn't say what was on his mind. And we see that to be a, we see that to be a characteristic of Nehemiah. Look, go, look back with me. Look back with me. Uh, let me see. Where is this? Uh, look, look, at, look in chapter 2. And look with me in verse 14. Nehemiah here is, is talking. He said, then, when, then I went up on the gate of the fountain to the king's pool, for there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then went I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered at the gate. And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did. Neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. In other words, what happened was he kept all that to himself, didn't he? Have you ever heard that you can give away too much information? Sure, sometimes people just talk too much about something. And people can gather the little facts and put it together. But he didn't tell anyone what was in his heart. He didn't reveal those things. And so he acted wisely, all right, until the time was right. He did not reveal it. And so the same thing is true here. He consulted with himself. He did it prudently. He did it patiently. And he did it privately. And that's the best remedy because, you know, when you're doing it privately, you can talk to the Lord privately, can't you? You sure can. Is he able to answer you back privately? He sure will. Yes, he will. And so that's what he did. Now think about it, you know, because, because you know, uh, Ecclesiastes said, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. That's where anger rests. Let me give you the last one. Go to Acts 24 with me. Acts 24. We talked about David, what he did. He quieted himself like a weaned child because he was growing up. Nehemiah, he ruled his own spirit in that he consulted with himself. 
He didn't give a knee-jerk reaction. He didn't give an impulsive reaction. Even though he had been made angry by the disposition of the nobles, the people with the most were complaining the most. The people with the greatest advantages were whining the most. Acts 24, look in verse 16. Familiar passage of Scripture. We're talking about ruling our own spirit. We looked at three men, David, Nehemiah, and now lastly, Paul. Verse 16, Paul said what? And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and man. So what did he do? We saw David quieted himself, he comforted himself, he encouraged himself. Nehemiah consulted with himself. What did, what did Paul do? He exercised himself. He exercised himself. It was a practice thing. He said, herein do I exercise myself. He wasn't talking about lifting weights when he got upset. He wasn't talking about running to get rid of all the adrenaline that's been built up in me. Now I know adrenaline, I know how that works, the fight or flight, I've, I've had all that, I've taught all that stuff, you know, all those things that the, that, the, uh, that, that the medical community puts out there, and those are natural reactions. You're, you get that from the adrenal glands, you can't help it, that's how you're wired. How do you get that out? You metabolize it out. You don't eat chocolate afterwards, you don't drink alcohol, you don't do that anyway, amen. And uh, no stimulants when you got all that. You can exercise it out. It can process out that way. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. Paul is talking about, I'm exercising my conscience. Something that he practiced himself. This was something that he practiced continually. What does it mean? It means to always have a clean and sensitive conscience. You don't want to dull your conscience by violating it all the time. You don't want a dead one. You don't want it seared. That's what Timothy talks about, having a conscience that's been seared. What does that mean? You know, that's what they would do with a wound. When a soldier, a Roman soldier, got injured, what would they do? They would heat up a sword or a dagger, depending upon the size of the injury. They'd put it in the fire, get it red hot, expose that arm. What would they do? They would cauterize that. They would burn that wound as if the wound didn't hurt already. And now you put the fire on it. But you know what they do? They actually make a third degree burn out of it. When you give, when you inflict a third degree burn, you're actually burning up the nerve endings so there's no more pain. You seal it off, so now there's no more bleeding. If it was infected, not anymore. They sear it. That was battlefield medicine in the Roman army. Pretty tough, huh? But Paul didn't want a deadened conscience by keeping on violating it, violating it, violating it. Because it loses its sensitivity. Listen, whether you, to exercise yourself in these things, to have a keep a clean conscience, a clear conscience, to consult with yourself, to do what David did, quieting himself, encouraging himself, going to the prayer closet, all these things depend on your relationship with the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, so here's the thing. To rule your own spirit is to take yourself off of the throne and put the Lord Jesus on the throne of your heart. And so just let me ask you this. How, how Are you and the Holy Spirit on speaking terms? Is everything all right? How is your relationship with Him? Is He grieved or quenched? Because you're going to have a hard time when agitated or stimulated by some external or internal foe. In other words, if he's grieved or quenched and you're not on speaking terms and you're living carnally, you're going to have a hard time ruling your spirit. You're going to get what I illustrated in that glass. That carnality that was inside of us and it, when we get full of that, somebody aggravates us, rubs us the wrong way, does something perceived or real, they get what we're full of. 
Now, if we're full of the Holy Spirit, then what are they going to get? They're going to get the Holy Spirit's response, aren't they? What is His response? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. Ooh, there's one, huh? Gentleness. Boy, that... Well, man, we're from Texas, Brother Ed. Gentleness. You know, it, you know, it is a highly appreciated spirit when you have a, a spirit of gentleness about you. You know, what do they say a lot of times about people that are really big? Like, do you remember Hoss Cartwright? Some of those that were that way. You know, what do they call them? They called them what? The gentle giants. Because they knew what they could do if they got out of control. They knew that they could, get, they could hurt somebody. I'm just saying, all this for us depends on the Holy Spirit to help us. He's really the only one that can help you to rule your spirit. I think that's what was working. Remember, remember what was said about, about Moses and I'm going to be done. Remember what they said about Moses? What did, what did the Bible say in the book of Numbers? Listen to this. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit had him write it. He recorded it. And he recorded under inspiration. Notice what it says. It says, The man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Numbers 12 and 3. He was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Does that mean that Moses was a weak man? Meekness is strength that is under control. Moses did hit the rock, though, didn't he? Did Moses have a temper? Yes, he did. Did it get the best of him? Yes, it did. Did it cost him? Yes, it did. So, beloved, you know, Moses wrote in Psalm, in Psalm 90, verse 17, he said, Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. That would be that, that spirit that is rule. Let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. Do you ever pray that, Lord? Let your beauty be upon my life. Let your beauty be the thing that is seen by others. My wife, my children, my grandchildren. Let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. I think, it's, I think it's a noble request that we have the right spirit about us, even when things are going sour around us. Amen. Aren't you glad sometimes in a crisis that there's somebody around that knows what to do? There's somebody that's not taken over with the mob mentality their passions and their emotions don't take charge and make them hysterical or uncontrollable, right? But there's someone there that knows what to do. That someone in our lives as believers, that someone is the Holy Spirit. And so cultivating our relationship with Him, beloved, is vital. You want more patience? Ask Him. You want more kindness? Ask Him. You want more gentleness? Ask Him. Lord, help me in this area. Help me in this area. Amen? Let's pray. Father.